I met somebody this week, and they said they were watching home from the bedroom, and the wife had stepped out of the bedroom, and the husband said, you said, get up. <laughs> so I said, I stood up, I was standing in the middle of the bedroom by myself, my wife came back and said, what's wrong? <laughs> it's a crazy preacher, he's got us up praying, so. It's such a privilege to be with God's people. Amen. Tell somebody that's near you how precious they are in the sight of God. You don't have to touch them. I know it's time of year. You don't have to do that, but you can at least speak. All right? If you're watching this at home, you're precious in the sight of God, even at home. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great privilege and honor of celebrating Jesus' entry into time. I thank you that we have the freedom to do so and the resources to do so, that we can travel, that we can stand in the public square and say, Jesus is Lord, that we can open the doors of our churches and welcome people in, Lord. We praise you. You have blessed our lives extravagantly. And we pause tonight to acknowledge you and to say thank you. Lord, our calendars are full and our schedules are busy. Our hearts are filled with dreams and aspirations, and I pray in the midst of that this week, Lord, we invite you to give us an awareness of those around us, those with whom we interact that are desperate. Lord, give us discernment beyond ourselves. Show us simple expressions of kindness that would bring joy or healing or hope to melt the walls of isolation and loneliness and resentment, hurt. I thank you for it. I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son. And we offer ourselves this week, Father, as ambassadors for you, ministers of reconciliation. I thank you for what you will do. Lord, I thank you that in the days and the weeks ahead, we will celebrate with many people whose lives were changed through those God-directed God -directed activities this week. We praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You should have received an outline when you came in. If you didn't, it was probably because the ushers don't like you. I'm kidding. They treat everybody like that. <clears throat> if you're watching online, you can download it from the websites or the apps. I'd like to take this session and next and, and look at the, the familiar story with us, passages of Scripture that I suspect you know about as well as any sections in the Bible. But I just want to walk through them with you, offer a bit of a running commentary, because I believe they have some very real parallels to what's happening in our world. I wouldn't pretend to know the exact timeline, but I believe just as certainly as Jesus came the first time that He's returning to the earth. And I believe many of the circumstances that were prevalent when he came the first time will be prevalent when he comes the second time. And I think the better we understand the characters in the narratives that are so familiar to us, the better we can be prepared ourselves. You know, there's a lot of ways to understand and interpret and comment on what's been happening in our world. but. It seems to me in the, at, the, in the, at the simplest level, the most direct level, that a little over two years ago, there was a tremendous shift in our world. From one vantage point, I could suggest that there was a group of people that recognized an opportunity with a virus that apparently escaped from Wuhan as a means of asserting authority or reestablishing authority over nations and maybe even over multiple nations. But I would also comment from the vantage point where we stand today that God has used this season to pull back the curtains, to bring an awakening to his people, an awareness that we lacked a little over two years ago. We were walking down a pathway, for the most part, unaware and unconcerned and uninvolved in some expressions of darkness and evil and wickedness that were plunging our world in a very dangerous direction. And God began to awaken His church. I see evidence of that week upon week upon week. In this past year, we have had messages from all 50 states and many nations. We've had visitors on our campus from over 30 states. 
And really, it's a rallying call. It's not about a single ministry, because most of those people I've talked to are part of multiple ministries and expressions of faith, but it's an awakening and awareness that God is moving and stirring the hearts of His people. That's really good news. But that's happening in contrast to some other things that are happening. We're also witnessing the rise of paganism. Not a new thing. Paganism has emerged throughout human history, but we're seeing the emergence of paganism in a way we have not seen in our lifetimes. You know, there's a growing intolerance, almost a complete intolerance for a biblical worldview. Now, corresponding to that is the deterioration in human character. Values which have shaped Western culture for hundreds of years are being discarded. And there's labels that are attached to them that cause them to be thrown into the trash bin, we are told. Labels like it's out of date, it's patriarchal, it's racist, it's xenophobic, transphobic, homophobic. It's phobic of something. It's repressive, capitalistic, uninformed, anachronistic, fundamentalist, Christian nationalist, and the list goes on and on. It's, it's a, there's, a, there's a labeling taking place, and you all understand it because most of us are tempted to, tempted to mute our voices or certainly select our audiences because we don't want to be labeled or deplatformed or canceled or suffer, suffer the economic consequences of impacting our business because we identified too broadly or boldly with Jesus are becoming the targets of attorneys and legal action because we invited somebody to do something as radical as pray. You understand it. We don't think about it perhaps too frequently, and we don't talk about it as often as we might. But the results of this pathway become more clear with each day. There's increasing violence. We see justice being applied inconsistently to gain or maintain power in too many cases. There's widespread censorship, things that we haven't seen in our culture. There is state-sponsored deception, rapidly rising authoritarianism in our own nation and around the globe, diminished rights for the minority, immorality, families no longer manage, imagined to be the fundamental training point for children. Disrespect for authority, greed, envy, unbridled pursuit of pleasure, Children, to a startling degree, have become prey for demonic ideas and activity. Now, my opinion, we are facing circumstances that will lead us to one of two outcomes, and the outcome isn't clear to me yet. One possibility is the awakening of God's people and a wide, more widespread expression of heartfelt repentance, and God would respond with expressions of grace and mercy and renewal. I think the alternative would be expressions of God's judgment. I, I, I don't know that that outcome has been determined. It, it isn't clear to me, but I think those possibilities exist. Many current circumstances remind me of the first century, that time period into which Jesus emerged, that time when he was born. I believe there will be many parallels between that season and the season when Jesus returns to the earth his first entry into time, and his second entry into planet Earth, we're told we'll have many parallels. So I, I think that the, the birth narratives are very, very relevant. They're not just a holiday acknowledgement. And what I'd like to do with you in this session is look at Matthew's gospel. I'm just going to read with you through the, the narrative. I'll stop with some comments. I'm banking on the Scripture being familiar to you for two purposes. Sometimes familiarity causes us to read through it rather casually. And then the, being familiar with the characters will make it easier to have a commentary. I'm going to submit to you that Matthew's presentation combines two things, divine direction, that God is very intentionally and purposefully providing direction to His people. You know He does that. And it, it, it couples that with the fulfillment of Scripture that if you didn't believe in divine intervention or divine direction, or you didn't believe in the authority of Scripture, Matthew's presentation would remain totally a mystery. If you discount those two things, it becomes completely fictional. So a part of what I'm asking you to do is to consider the, the way you imagine God's engagement in your life. Do you believe He still provides direction to human beings? And have you settled the issue on the authority of Scripture? 
or do you still stand apart from it as the judge? There are parts of it I don't understand, but I'm determined to treat it as if it's authoritative in my life. Maybe the most important questions of the entire session have to do with how you understand God's direction in your life and the role that you attach to Scripture. To say that you hold a high view of Scripture and not read your Bible is incredibly inconsistent. So I'm not trying to add something to your to-do list of Christmas week, but Matthew gives us this account with a mix of that divine direction and scriptural fulfillment. So let's start. Chapter 1. In verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. I think we have to begin with the acknowledgement here that in Matthew's gospel, it's a bit understated, certainly more so than it will be in Luke's but that the Jesus story begins with the supernatural. Matthew says in a rather quiet way, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit, as if that explains everything. What it does is makes clear to us that it wasn't the the result of something that had happened with Mary and Joseph. The Jesus story in the earth cannot be separated from the supernatural. It couldn't be then, and it cannot be now. That's important because as we approach Jesus' re-entry into time, we will, we will become increasingly dependent upon the supernatural presence of God. Amen. There would have been no Jesus story in the first century without God's supernatural involvement. There will be no re- re-entry of Jesus into the earth without God's supernatural involvement. Amen. So we're going to have to open our hearts to that a little more fully, a little more completely open our minds and our imaginations. We've done our best. I've spent my life in in church and religious systems and academic settings, and we've worked really, really hard to push the, the miraculous engagement of God to the periphery, to point at all of our advancements or technology or whatever and suggest we have replaced it. There is no replacement for the supernatural power of God in our lives. Verse 20, back to Joseph. But after he'd considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do you think the angels know your name? Be awkward if an angel showed up at your house to talk to you and had the wrong name. (laughs) So your faith will get a whole lot more personal if you imagine that the angels know you by name. They're not looking at some faceless, shapeless amorphous mass of humanity that's just teeming around on the earth like you and I look at an anthill. You know, yeah, there's something alive down there and there's a lot of movement, but it's indifferent. It's certainly not specific. I believe the angels know our names. I believe they're aware of our circumstances. The Bible says they're ministering spirits sent forth on our behalf. And Joseph has a dream and an angel intrudes and said, Joseph, son of David, Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel is just the transliteration of a Hebrew word, which which meaning is God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. You know, we read that 24th verse as if it makes perfect sense to us. Folks, if you had a dream and you saw an angel that told you to do something as bizarre as that angel was asking Joseph to believe, yes, your fiance is pregnant, but it's the Holy Spirit. I bet you'd check your diet before you check the box on obedience. I bet I would too. Uh, I want to point out that there's something happening in the hearts of these young people, because Joseph and Mary at this point are not grizzled veterans. They're kids, teenagers more than likely, certainly the most young adults, but they're, they're beginning a journey. And it says when he woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had told him to do. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. 
And he gave him the name Jesus. Self-control written all over that in many, many ways. You know self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. You can't really argue you're a spiritual person if you don't demonstrate self-control. We've gotten so sloppy with our obedience to the Lord. We really have. It's the reason I believe God has begun this awakening, because he's preparing a people for his purposes as we approach the culmination of the age. And it's going to require of us a self-control we haven't had to demonstrate for a long time. That's good news. Matthew informs the reader, if you've never heard the story and you've never seen it before, that Joseph had angelic direction. He just didn't make a decision about Mary based on his own whim. The angel said, she's trustworthy. And you not only should trust her, you should walk with her. It's an interesting way that Matthew tells the story. In verse 21, he concludes the angel's message. In verse 21, the angel says to Joseph, she'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. There's quotations that close there. And then in verse 22, Matthew does something. He uses a little author's license. He inserts a prophecy from Isaiah 7. He says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That was not part of the angel's message. That's part of Matthew's commentary on the story he's telling you. Joseph didn't get the quote from the angel. Matthew's trying to help you and I as readers understand a bit of the background of what's happening. By the time we get to verse 24, the reader is back in real time. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home with his wife. I want to ask you a question now, and it's a question I'm going to repeat through this session. Do you think Joseph knew the prophecy? Oh. I'd go easy on the of courses. I think it's a possibility. How well do you know the prophecies concerning the end of the age and how they might relate to you? Do you know them well enough they could be personal? That where trust was broken and faithfulness seems to be completely broken? That you could climb over that because you would respond to something the Lord said to you? It isn't that clear to me. And as we walk through this, we'll, we'll repeat the question, and I, we'll see. Look at chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea. Judea is a region, Bethlehem's a city. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Well, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And he called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them, where is the Christ or the Messiah to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem, in Judea. For this is what this prophet has written. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. I think we have to start in that section by acknowledging that the imagination of Jesus' arrival, the, ar the arrival of the Messiah, is described in Matthew's gospel as causing Herod to be disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. Not excited, not anticipatory, not filled with joy, not hopeful, disturbed. Words have meaning. And the most accurate description of what happened in the palace, and it says in all of Jerusalem, was that there was, they were disturbed. The Bible's pretty clear on this. Jesus is disruptive. I mean, he'll go on in his public ministry when we get to that point later in the narrative, and he said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring division. It's something we've got to grapple with because we're in a world now where we would like everybody to love us because we say we love Jesus. And we have the imagination that if you're a Jesus advocate, that will bring peace and contentment and healing into every circumstance where you would make that announcement. We have that idea, but I would submit to you it really isn't biblical. That Jesus is a rock, a stumbling rock, 
a point of offense. He has been since his arrival. He's continued to be so through history. That doesn't mean you should be obnoxious or I should be obnoxious. We don't want to be the stumbling point. We don't want to be the cause of division. It's not about us. It's about the one we call Lord. If it's about us, we need to go back and put our face on the carpet until we get that worked out. But I think this section to me begins with the disruption that Jesus brings. And then Matthew, again, he inserts a message from the prophet. This time it's from the prophet Micah. He quotes Micah 5 about the Bethlehem being the point of Messiah's birth. And the chief priest and the teachers of the law knew the prophecy. I want to ask the question again. Do you think Mary and Joseph knew the prophecy? It isn't stated. It's not implied. There seem to be a lot of questions that they have as they walk this out. I would submit to you it's an enormously difficult leap from having a single verse in Micah and imagine that it has your name written on it. I don't think it would have been any easier for them to do that than it would be for you or me to read a verse from someplace in our Bible and imagine it, had so, it became so personal that it had your name written on it. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that's not an easy step of faith. But it's important enough that Matthew keeps pushing this little paradigm back to us. Look at verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Let's pause there again just a second. Herod said, he's in Bethlehem. You go find him and come back and tell I want to worship him too. Did Herod want to worship him? No, you do know the story. <laughs> Not even a little. How shocked are we when we find people in authority over us or people with power over us who are less than forthright? Well, 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 well. Blah, 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 blah. And the church tragically too quickly defaults to the position that God's purposes couldn't break forth if there is some deceptive, wicked, ungodly voice with authority over us. Look, I've been saying for a long time now, the solutions we need aren't political. They're not about parties and candidates. We're so idolatrous when the elections don't go the way we want, we're discouraged and despondent. Look, God didn't abdicate the throne because of elections. God's purposes will break forth in spite of our systems of government, Amen. not because of them. Deception and evil are exhibited at the very beginning of Jesus' life. It's going to become more clear. Look at verse 9. After they heard the king, they, the magi, went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. That's the NIV. It's a little understated. The other translations, I think, are better. The, the, the New English Version says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's getting a little closer. If you've made a two-year journey following a star for a king, and you finally get to this place where the star is stopped, and there's a baby there that you believe is the king, you know, you know, they were kind of happy. <laughs> I like the expanded version of that. It, it's a little more literal. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, ecstatic, beside themselves, over the top. They could have cared less what people thought of their behavior. They're all in, amazed, blown away, shocked. It's rocked their world. And we're still quibbling about, well, I don't know if I'm really going to be moved to raise my hands in worship. <laughs> you know, I'm a bit more of an introvert. <laughs> yeah, me too. Kind of. I mean, you can pick whatever it is. We quibble with the Lord around things. And I think it's far more a reflection of how little the value is we attach to the things of the Lord. 
These people have disrupted their lives, shredded their calendars, caused their friends to think they've lost their minds. They've invested enormous amounts of money. They spent months and months on a pilgrimage with no promised satisfaction. When they finally made it to Jerusalem, the king of Judea lies to them and deceives them and manipulates them. And yet God still leads them to Jesus. And they are beside themselves. You see, I think if you want that kind of emotion, if you want that kind of a sense of contentment and satisfaction in your faith, we're going to have to begin to imagine that our faith deserves more than a casual inquiry, than an intermittent visit, than a few minutes on the week that we relegate to our time of faith. But the rest of the time is ours, and the things that we really want to do populate that part of our lives. So I think there's a much more significant message here for the, for the God story to break through. This is taking multiple people who are more than just casually involved, Mary and Joseph. This is not like a, they've signed up for another 12-week course. And the Magi have made a significant investment as well. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Imagine powerful, wealthy people in a barn, bowing down to some very modest people. They opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. They opened their wealth in this circumstance. There's no affirmation. This is all based upon their calculations and a star they've followed. And this is in spite of the deception of Herod. There's something in their hearts that challenges me. There's something in their attitude that speaks to me. I want to cultivate a little bit more of that. There's a bit of an abandonment in them, not a recklessness. See, I think if we're going to see the purposes of God in, in grander ways, in more transformational ways, we're going to have to follow him with a little bit more space within us for who he is. In verse 12, God responds to them. There's a little verse in Hebrews. It says that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I love that verse. I would encourage you to always keep a place in your life alive where you are diligently seeking the Lord. How you do that changes. Changes with seasons of your life and calendars and responsibilities. But you always want to keep a place alive where it can be said of you that in that area, I am diligently seeking God. You do. Because God rewards those who diligently seek Him. Folks, I'm doing my best to invite you away from this notion that you pray a prayer and take a dip in a pool and all your God business is done. It's destructive. It's deceptive. It's wicked. I believe in conversion and salvation. I believe in the new birth. I believe in the significance of water baptism. But you're not finished with the Lord. Amen. Diligently seek Him. The Magi have certainly done that. And now that they've found Jesus, you could say God has met His obligation. He led them to Jesus. But having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They're warned in a dream. They get direction beyond their life experience, and they are, by definition, wise guys. And yet God provides them direction from beyond themselves, beyond their personal wisdom, beyond their personal experience. And I know we're familiar with those little voices now when we're traveling that says, you know, redirecting, <laughs> recalculating. They just got a dream. Verse 13, when they'd gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. I bet by this time, Joseph is getting a little skittish when he's sleepy. <laughs> and the angel said, get up and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Again, we read through that kind of quickly because we know the characters and we know the narrative. And we think, yeah, it makes perfect sense. We've got to leave Bethlehem. Now we're going to go to Egypt. 
But if I'm the one that's traveling with them, if I'm in this loop, if, if I signed on for this little tour, that's some bizarre stuff. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, take the child and go to Egypt. Stay there for an indefinite period of time. I'll tell you when you can come home. And verse 14 says, he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and he left for Egypt. Now, I suppose you want to get creative. You can say it doesn't say he left that night, but now we're arguing about tomato and tomato. It doesn't say that he polled all of his friends or he went to see six rabbis or he put four different fleeces out for the Lord. I think it's a legitimate conclusion that he quickly packed up and left. Matthew seems to be suggesting with the immediacy of darkness. Joseph's cultivating an obedience to the Lord that speaks to me. An angel of the Lord warns him. Matthew reminds us again, it's become his habit by now, of the, the, he reminds us as the reader, not Joseph, but you and I as the reader understand that this flight to Egypt is a, being instigated back from Hosea 11. Question again. Do you think Mary and Joseph imagine that Hosea 11.1 applied to them? I think by this point, that's becoming a big lift. They had much less access to Scripture than you and I do. What they know of Scripture, they hear from readings in the synagogue on Sabbath. I promise you, they didn't have their own copy. So they've learned the scripture from being in public worship and hearing the portions read. It's possible they know it. But Luke, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew can't tell us the story apart from the fact that what's happening to them had been indicated in scripture. Let's push on a little bit. Verse 16, when Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, Herod has no spiritual perspective at all. He wasn't outwitted by the Magi. He was outmaneuvered by the creator of heaven and earth. There was a whole angelic contingent trying to thwart Herod's wickedness and evil. They redirected the Magi. He was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. I think we at least have to note in passing that there was no supernatural intervention for the children. The male children in Bethlehem, two and under, lost their lives. Imagine the grief that would bring to a community. Imagine the pain. I can't. See, I, th I think we have to address it. I, I want to raise it in your awareness because from time to time you'll hear some knucklehead say that the new they like the New Testament because it's not so harsh. Which one do you read? <laughs> I really find a great deal of consistency between the character of God in my Bible. Amen. Now, Matthew, once again, by now, as you're familiar with, he reminds the reader of the prophecy. This time he's quoting Jeremiah 31 about the tragedy that will come to Bethlehem. I pose a question now that is becoming, I hope, familiar to you. Do you imagine that Mary and Joseph knew that prophecy and imagine that it applied to them? Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. 
One way of understanding this narrative in Matthew is as a fulfillment of the prophets. In fact, it seems to speak, if not more loudly, certainly as loudly to the faithfulness of the prophets as it does to the faithfulness of Mary and Joseph. Does that seem reasonable to you? There's no significant event we've been told about so far that hadn't been prophesied by the prophets hundreds of years in advance. Now, Mary and Joseph are living it out in real time, certainly with expressions of faithfulness on their part, but it was the faithfulness of God's people in preceding generations that paved the way for what we're reading about. So whether we're actually in the fulfillment of the end of the age or we're simply necessary for it to emerge, you have a significant role in the unfolding story of God's purposes. Amen, Pastor. We believe that. I'll do both sides of this. It's okay. <laughs> Verse 19, for just as an aside, it's not the only time we see it, but it says an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. The implication is very clear. That not every spiritual being is under the authority of the Lord. This happens to be an angel of the Lord. A third of the angels rebelled with Satan. And while we don't think of them in terms of angels of the Lord, they were created by God in those roles with certain abilities. We need a much more sophisticated, a much more robust, a heightened awareness of spiritual things. I don't want you to check your brain at the door. I don't want you to be irrational or illogical. I want you to imagine that there, is, there are more forces shaping your life than the ones you can fully interpret with your intellect. If you don't believe that, you've rejected God because God is the spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, the spirit, created the material world in which we live. And we've lived apart from spiritual things for far too long. We need the help of the angels of the Lord. They're ministering spirits, the Bible says sent forth on our behalf. We should be more aware of them, more conscious of their abilities, the roles they've been given, the assignments they've had, how we've interacted with them in the past. The Bible says some of us have entertained angels unaware. We have so little discernment. We were being in the presence of the angels and haven't known it. God continues to provide for Joseph supernatural guidance. Now, Joseph has an awareness of what's happening in Jerusalem, and he responds to a political circumstance. Archelaus is reigning in Judea, so Joseph goes to Nazareth. He's afraid there's enough of a, a lingering remembrance from Herod that his son will have a similar character or hatred, so he goes to a, a more remote region of Israel. I'm intrigued. It says he's warned in a dream so he withdraws to the district of Galilee. Angels gave directions because of a political circumstance. That's in the text. The angel said, well, if he's ruling there, you better go to Nazareth. See, if I'm writing that narrative, I mean, with, without any awareness of prophets or scripture, and I'm going to tell a God story, I would say there's a wicked king, but it's time for Jesus to go to Nazareth because that's where he's going to grow up. So let's just take Archelaus out. I mean, it happens in other places. But in this case, God simply gives a warning. You understand, our faith cannot be understood. It can't be lived out apart from contemporary culture. Theoretical Bible studies and ignoring the world around us is avoiding our responsibilities to be salt and light. And Matthew, one more time, reminds the reader that this set of events and circumstances, Jesus going to Nazareth when he's still a small child to grow up, is fulfilling prophecy. And by now, the familiar question, do you imagine that Mary and Joseph know the prophecies? I want to push this just to one more segment from Matthew. The next, very next verse, it's Matthew 3. You know when this was really originally written, there weren't chapter headings and verses those were added hundreds of years later. It's, they're just reference tools. And sometimes I think they're disruptive. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. 
Matthew tells us John's message. Matthew tells the reader what John's message was. That's intriguing to me. That recorded in Scripture is the message that John shared to prepare the way of the Lord. Matthew also reminds us of a prophecy concerning John. By now, you know that's a, a habit that Matthew has in presenting this narrative. He's supporting these remarkable acts as fulfillments of what the prophets have said. This time he quotes Isaiah 40 and verse 3. But I want to ask you the question. A moment ago, when I asked it the first time, there were a lot of nods affirming that absolutely Mary and Joseph thought that verse was all about them. May I ask you this? Did John know the Isaiah passage referred to him? John had some insight. He had some awareness. He said, I'm not the Messiah. He's coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I shouldn't touch a strap on his sandal. So he's very biblically aware. I mean, his story is a very supernatural story. But I think it's a, it's a big step to imagine that John looked at Isaiah 40 and go, that's me. I think when they signed his high school annual, they wrote out next to his picture, Isaiah 40? <laughs> Do they still have high school annuals? John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, and he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, God's people don't always say nice things. That's not licensed to use abusive language. But again, I think it's a mistake. We, we often say that the New Testament is just filled with hugs. John looked at the people whose, had they embraced his message, I assure you John's disciples thought it would have made the expanding story of the ministry much more easily accomplished. And John said, you bunch of snakes. If you can step back in that picture, you can see his disciples cringing. Could you tone it down a little bit? They could help us. They're powerful and they're wealthy and they're influential. You bunch of snakes. Now we've done this pretty quickly, but just to give you a quick summary, there were six separate prophecies that Matthew has identified. That first chapter in verse 22, it said, this all took place to fulfill what the Lord had said about the prophet, the virgin will be with child. That's Isaiah 7. Then in verse 53, it said, In Bethlehem and Judea, this is what the prophet has written. You, Bethlehem, and the hand of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. That's Micah 5. And when, when Joseph is warned, he said he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed, fulfilling what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. It's a Hosea 11. And then the babies that are murdered in Bethlehem, Matthew tells us, came from Jeremiah 31. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. And then when Mary and Joseph find their way back to Israel, it says they were warned in a dream and withdrew to Galilee, but that was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he'll be called a Nazarene. And then Matthew holds to the principle, because I think the principle is more important than just the narrative. With John the Baptist's story, it said John came preaching in the desert of Judea. He was the one who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, and he quotes Isaiah 40. So prophecies are cited to us from Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, Jeremiah regarding the circumstances of the Messiah's birth, the town of his birth, the flight into Egypt, suffering in Bethlehem, Nazareth is a hometown, the message of Jesus' predecessor. God had a lot to say about what would happen before the Messiah came. 
And yet the overwhelming majority of the population, and remember, they're the covenant people of God. They worship at temple, they go to synagogue, they eat the right foods and have the right holidays and use the right words. They are God's chosen people. They look at the rest of the world as if they are on the outside. So when we talk about awakening, I want to invite you to imagine that there's room in our lives to be awakened, perspectives to be embraced, scripture to be understood, prophecies to be lived out, supernatural directions to be received, difficult assignments to be accepted, suffering to be observed, endured, and overcome. That same passage, there are seven separate instances of supernatural guidance. In verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. Mary was pledged to be married, and she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's something. Verse 20, this was Joseph. After he considered all of this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, don't be afraid of Mary. She really is trustworthy. Wouldn't you like to have been there for that conversation? I mean, we're told that he's already made his mind up about Mary. He's reached a conclusion. She's made an announcement, and he's reached a conclusion. It's a legitimate inference that they've had a discussion. I'm not going to make a public spectacle of you. I'm not going to try to humiliate you, but this is not happening. Well, I think it's safe to say that Mary made her case. It's not what you think. You've leapt to a conclusion that's not true. I don't think we're being unfair to the text to imagine there could have been some emotion in that discussion, some hurt all the way around the circle. And now Joseph has a dream and an angelic visitor, and when we read that as if, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense, now he's got it sorted out. Uh-huh. Don't be afraid to take Mary home. I think that next conversation may be even more awkward than the previous one. Oh, so now you believe me. Well, it's in the Bible. Nobody would talk like that. <laughs> the third instance, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it's chapter 2, first verse, during the time of King Herod, they came to Herod and said, we saw a star. You read that like it's normal. People come in great distances. They say, we're searching for God. We want to understand God better. There's a new king of the Jews that's been born. Are you on a God journey? Or do you think you've completed yours? Tell me about the disruptions in your life, the disruption to your dreams, the new paths you'll walk, imagining it's a God journey. Number four, it's in verse 12, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they took another route. It's... Oh. Verse 13, number five, when they'd gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joe in a dream and said, you got to move. Number six, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, you can go back now. Again, we're reading all this like, it's, oh, yeah, that'd be no problem. Folks, we have God direction. We ignore it every week. Forgive one another. Tithe. Now I'm meddling. Don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves. Oh, well, well, well. Those aren't like essentials. Oh, you mean essential like, I'll call my son out of Egypt. And they imagine that's personal enough they load the donkey and head south. What do you suppose it would take for us to get, take the word of God personally? Do you understand the tremendous degree to which we've stepped away from it and we've imagined it that it's theoretical and that, that we can just choose and 
select and kind of arbitrarily wander through and go, oh, I like that. That sounds really good. But I don't like that part so much. I think I'll go over here and look around this room and see what's in here. You see, for supernatural guidance to be impactful in our lives, the Lord has to know we're trustworthy to be obedient with whatever he shows us. That's about growing up. You understand that small children, have a, you, they have to be taught obedience. It's not innate. It's not instinctive. I mean, I know the goal, first-time obedience, but nobody starts ringing that bell. We may grow to it sometimes, but we have that same objective in our hearts with the Lord. Do we really intend to be obedient? Or are we just searching for the promises that we want to apply? It's a worthwhile question. And finally, the seventh one's in verse 22. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, afraid to come having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. He went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Off the beaten path, tucked away in the hills. I got a minute? Not much. I got about a minute. Too bad. What's our response? It's an important part. I would submit, first of all, it's the value of God's word in our lives. We want to begin to attach more value to that. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have the word of the prophets. This is Peter, the fisherman Jesus recruited. Now he's near the end of his life. So he's got a lot of experience tucked under his belt since he was recruited out of a fishing business on the shores of Galilee. In fact, in this letter, he's saying to us, I'm about to leave here. I'm about done. This tent I'm living in has got to get folded up. And so his message to his audience is, we have the word of the prophets, and you'll do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They're not just the words of people. They're not just religious opinions. God has provided direction to us. I promise you most of the people in that first century audience did not connect the passages that Matthew gave us to Jesus in the moment when they were being experienced. And if you step back from it a little bit, then you, you think about it, the verses that we've looked at, the prophetic passages, were typically just a single verse. They include more than one prophet, different settings, different time periods. It's not a comprehensive collection of verses regarding the arrival of Messiah neatly tucked into six chapters in Isaiah. That's the way we would prefer it. What Matthew does show to us and what Peter is underlining for us is a very high value of Scripture. That there is no New Testament narrative without the Old Testament. It makes no sense. I know we're slogging through the back end of the Old Testament right now. Daniel gave us a little hope that we're back amongst the prophets. Hosea and Joel and Amos, here we go. The value of God's Word in your life, I don't believe, can be overstated. We don't want to worship the book, but we need to understand that the Bible is, is, is points us to the character of God, the purposes of God, the will of God, the stories of God, and we are privileged to have it. Amen. And I'll close with a question. What shall we do? What's our assignment? Well, in Acts 2 and 36, it's the day of Pentecost. You know that story, I hope. Peter's preached to the crowd in response to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he says, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Again, those are very harsh words. He's standing in the streets of Jerusalem and saying, you crucified the Messiah. That's not bridge building. That's not an expression of kindness or tolerance. That's not big tent language. You crucified the Messiah, not the Romans. Jews don't crucify people. Romans do that. But he's talking to an overwhelmingly Jewish audience saying, you crucified him. You worked it out. You arranged it. You orchestrated it. 
And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Please think about the audience. They're Jews in Jerusalem. There's a daily sacrifice offered in that city. The aroma of the sacrifice hangs over the city of the Jerusalem like the aroma of smoked pork does when you're going to your favorite barbecue joint. These are not people separate from the things of God. You can see the temple no matter where you are in the city of Jerusalem. Herod saw to that. He built it higher than any other piece of architecture, any other structure in the city. These are the people of God. And when they say, what shall we do? What does Peter say to them? Repent. Change your thought and change your behavior. Amen. And be baptized. Now, here's the kicker. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah. He's giving, that's a tall hill to climb. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Wait a minute, we just shouted to crucify him. You want us to align ourselves against the most powerful people in this city? Well, you asked. And that's the pathway. You see, Jesus has already pronounced judgment upon that generation. Jesus has already said that that generation is under interdict, that, that they have forfeited their privileges. So there's nothing to be done on the day of Pentecost that is going to reverse what Jesus has said for them collectively. They have forfeited their corporate opportunity. And now that opportunity you'll have to wait for another generation. That is the story. Because Jesus said in the concluding chapters of Luke that they're going to build an embankment against you and dash your baby's heads against the stones. Nothing that's going to happen in Acts chapter 2 is going to unring that bell. That's not being walked backwards. What Peter's extending is an opportunity for personal repentance and deliverance. The people say, what can we do? And he said, every one of you, repent. I want to come back to where we began. It seems to me that it's, it's plausible, at least, that we face a similar place in our lives. That could very well be the opportunity that is before our generation. It isn't clear to me, and I'm certainly not the authority. I'm not suggesting I am. It isn't clear to me whether national repentance remains a viable pathway for us. I can tell you this, we can't continue to flaunt God's values and celebrate them and turn our back on the protection of our children while we celebrate our own personal rights and imagine that God will just look the other way. What I do know for certain is that personal repentance is essential. And I would suggest to you it's the only option for transformation on a larger scale. And that we have to resist the temptation to think that deliverance is coming from beyond us. It's about parties or offices or elections or... I'm not opposed to those things. I believe we should be participants. But our deliverance will come because of the hearts of God's people. And the more completely we awaken to that, and the more quickly we step away from our self-righteousness and acknowledge the degree to which we have walked into the world and how little respect or fear of God we have had, the more quickly, I think, we will see God's answers begin to emerge. Amen. Let's take Peter's counsel. We have the words of the prophets, and we would be well served to pay attention to them. I didn't bring you a prayer. I wanted to pray for you tonight, if I may. If you'll stand with me. It's Christmas week, and we're reminded of God's extraordinary, unimaginable, inexplicable entrance into time, that he would send his son to put on an earth suit to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. He changed our eternities. He made it possible for us to be considered children of the king, citizens of his eternal kingdom. I'm not talking about churched people. 
I'm not asking you about which translation you prefer or which denomination you want to join or which worship style suits your personality. We were transferred from the kingdom of darkness with no future and brought into the kingdom of his son, whom God loves. And that all was launched through this amazing Christmas miracle. And the scripture tells us that Christmas miracle occurred through the lives of men and women saying yes to him, cooperating with him. Well, here's the awkward part. We're the 21st century edition. Let's not just gobble up the blessings that come from the obedience of our familiar friends, Mary and Joseph and the Magi. Let's say to the Lord, I'll cooperate with you so that your purposes can make a difference, not only in my life, but for the generation coming behind me. Amen. You willing to do that? Yes. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and its truth and authority and power in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the, the miracle that we have access to Scripture. In your grace and your mercy, Father, you have made it abundantly available to us, and we thank you for it. Lord, we pray that we won't simply be hearers, but that by your Spirit, you will direct us to the, the steps of obedience that would shape our lives. Lord, we stand with those who were listening to Peter when they heard the truth. It says they were cut to the heart and said, what shall we do? Father, what shall we do? We come in humility to repent, to acknowledge, Father, the degree to which we have been stiff-necked and self-absorbed and been interested in very minute ways in the things of your kingdom. Forgive us. We choose a new path. Holy Spirit, help us. Give us understanding hearts. Give us a longing for truth. Give us ears that can hear and eyes that can perceive. Help us to begin to see with your perspective the world in which we live. We thank you for it. We choose to honor you with our lives, to give you first place, to turn away from any way, any place that we have embraced ungodliness and to walk uprightly before you. Holy Spirit, help us. We thank you for it. May this be a triumphant week in our lives, a triumphant week in our nation, a triumphant week for the church and the earth. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. May your kingdom be exalted. May your purposes break forth. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.